and the way that they're graded. It's not like, oh, you're a creative English writer. Write me four different treatments of this screenplay. The English was more like, read this book. And did you see the theme of this book? And if you don't get the theme right, then you're wrong and you have a bad essay, right? Like, and of course, math and physics is just like that too. So it's like, instead of math being, oh, this is math. Can you see how it's used to make a fractal painting? It's more like, this is math. What's 4X equals 12? Solve for X. You didn't get X right, you're wrong, right? Like that way that they teach, the way that schooling is, encourages one, insecurity if you don't get the wrong answer, or you don't get the right answer, right? That insecurity leads to this human nature of, I can't be wrong. How do you navigate change? It's a question we think about often, and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin? And how do you develop the mindset and skills to be successful? You're listening to Designing Schools, and I'm your host, Dr. Saba Kidwai, educator, researcher, and storyteller. Join me each week as we explore design thinking and take a look at stories and strategies that bridge the gap between research and practice as together we explore how might we design schools. This week on the show, I'm taking you to Georgia Tech. From diversity to innovation to academic excellence, it's one of the top ranking universities with a vision to develop leaders who advance technology and improve the human condition. Today, I'm speaking with Wayne Lee and Michael Flanagan about how they're using design thinking at the college level to carry out this vision. Wayne Lee is the James L. Oliver Professor. It's a joint position between the Colleges of Design and Engineering. He teaches students that design behavior bridges the language and ideological gap between engineering and design. Prior to this, he taught in the design program at Stanford after spending time working with companies like Ford, Pottery Barn, and Volkswagen. Michael Flanagan is a business analyst and a chemical engineer. As a visionary leader, Michael leads the marketing and partnership efforts for the design block at Georgia Tech. As a student, he holds both undergraduate and graduate degrees from Georgia Tech. I begin by asking Wayne and Michael, what does design thinking mean to them? Most people would know it, design thinking is kind of as a, as a process, right? as a way to work through and identify issues, problems, and frame them in a way that allows you to creatively solve them. But I think it's a little bit more than that to me. To me, it's really more of a lifestyle, not just a process. The more and more you actually use it in your day-to-day life, the more it kind of ingrains on you. And as far as me personally, I've been a designer for a pretty long time, right? So I, you know, I was trained in fine arts and industrial design, transportation design, and engineering. So from, from undergraduate days, right? So from a very long time ago, the more and more you use those types of principles in your work, in your life, the more it really becomes a part of you, part of who you are and how you see the world. So how you approach things in the world. To me, it's the lifestyle, not just a process, right? And as a lifestyle, I mean, it encourages you to think in diverse ways. It encourages you to think both creatively and critically, both inductively and deductively. It's you know, empathetic as well as execution. Design thinking is about knowing all these different ways of thinking, ways of behaving, and ways of addressing the world, and being able to actually utilize it in your favor when you're actually asked to do something or asked to confront something. It is very much a lifestyle, but more importantly, I think it's just how we as humans have dealt with each other for a long time, right? I would say design thing is almost human nature because we try, we fail, we come back, we try, we fail, we come back and we end together. We have to make decisions, right? So if we look at our government, if we look at our world, if we look at in a household, how, what color should the walls be? That's a combination. That's a whole design process in and of itself, right? You have to decide hey, I like this watch. I like this color for this room. Like that's stuff that is that is innate to what we do every day. And I think that if we look at it from that perspective, everybody can do it as opposed to what we normally do in you know society is we say, oh, this person is an expert. So they must know and they must be a designer and they must be able to draw. It's like, no, none of that's true, right? Everybody is a designer. You pick what you want. 
And to answer your question earlier about how people are dealing with that, like when I came out in 2010, that was still, you know, the recession was still in place. I had to redesign how I thought about my career and I just connected with people. And I figured the thing that we do most is connect with one another and it's in our nature. So the more people can get used to that, as opposed to these systems that are really designed for an older archaic way of thinking or a specific function, we still have a lot of infrastructure around factory workers. How many of us are factory work, right? We were sitting on a Zoom call. I'm sure no factory worker in their life would ever be sitting on a Zoom call, right? But we are continuing to have this. So I think a lot of it is just getting back to our roots as humans and being able to connect with each other. Wayne and Michael both share the idea that design thinking is a lifestyle that's innate to who we are as humans. Yet many of the struggles we as individuals confront are rooted in fear. Fear of failure, fear of experimentation, fear of what others might think, fear of making the wrong choice. And in this state of fear, we're left paralyzed. I ask Michael and Wayne to share where these fears come from and how we've become so far removed from our innate nature as design thinkers. I can tell you this, and I'm sure Wayne can relate to this as well, because I think that this is what people grow up with. I think a lot of it has to do with, we oftentimes in life will say what's right and wrong. So I think a lot of times we engender shame in people that really does not help us, you know, be vulnerable. I was doing a lot of, you know, personal reflection and a lot of stuff this past week and stumbled across Brene Brown and her TED talk on vulnerability and, you know, stuff and shame. And I think the shame part is really the piece that really hurts us from trying stuff because it's like, well, if you fail, you're not going to get the good grade or somebody's going to say something about you. And from a, a religious sense, I think, which plays a, a major role, I would argue, in, in many people's lives, especially if you're Catholic or Christian or anything like that, it's being a good person. Like we, we innately want to be good people. And I think that we are often not any fault of our own. I think it's just things that we have to unlearn that we will often put unreasonable expectations on each other to be perfect. That nobody's going to be perfect. You know, nothing that's man-made is perfect. I, I had this analogy with my girlfriend the other day we were talking, and I was like, part of our personalities are like scratches. We polish them, but polishing in, in itself is scratching it up to a place where it shines. It doesn't make it any less valuable or any less beautiful. It just means that it's finer and finer scratches till you get to a point where it really shines, where you're there, it's imperceivable. So I think taking that approach and, and just saying, hey, I'm just going through a process. We're just trying to figure it out. Nobody has to be perfect is more important than us, you know, trying to get the right or wrong answer, which I think a lot of times we often strive for, even personally. So I, that's what I would say. Wayne builds on the ideas that Michael shares, especially around shame and the mindset shifts and observations he hears from his own students. Part of that is the way that schooling is. And it goes back to what Michael was saying. It's like, at a certain point, all the art programs, the drama programs, the music programs get killed. So there's no self-expression in that sense where you can learn that you can express yourself in different ways and it's okay. But then they start focusing purely on STEM and not STEAM, where it's just math, just English, just reading and writing. And so those are all one way of thinking. That's a logical, critical way of thinking. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's just one, but it's only one mindset. And the way that they're graded, it's not like, oh, you're a creative English writer, write me four different treatments of this screenplay. The English is more like, read this book. Did you see the theme? of this book. And if you don't get the theme right, then you're wrong and you have a bad essay. And of course, math and physics is just like that too. So it's like, instead of math being, oh, this is math. Can you see how it's used to make a fractal painting? It's more like, this is math. What's 4X equals 12? Solve for X. You didn't get X right? You're wrong, right? Like that, that way that they teach, the way that schooling is, encourages one, insecurity if you don't get the wrong answer, or you don't get the right answer, right? That insecurity leads to this human nature of, I can't be wrong. And it also, too, it encourages critical thinking, not creative thinking, right? Everybody's like, oh, we're all about critical thinking, critical thinking. I'm like, that's great. Did you realize there's creative thinking, too? Did you realize there's empathetic thinking? Like, there's, that's what we talk about when we talk about design thinking, is that there's more than one way to think. And so the number one feedback I get from students, going back to the students, is like, you're not only just teaching me how to design or how to approach problems you're showing me a different way I can access my potential. I haven't like literally in some of the visual design thinking classes, you're like, I haven't had to draw since kindergarten. But not only did you teach me how to draw, you made me love it. 
And you made me learn how to use it as a new way for me to see the world and to see my world, my problem, right? That I recall very poignantly because several students have said that. And then other students, they just say like the soul of the type of classes we teach. They have soul. That, that's all they said. To me, that means is we actually, again, participatory empowerment. We involve the students in shaping the curriculum. They participate in it. And then we empower them with the tools and skills we teach. That's the other part. It's not just read this chapter of this book. Do you get the answers at the back of the chapter? Oh, you're wrong. And we'll grade you on your right and wrongness of whether or not you get those back answers. It's like, here are tools. Here's what you're learning. Even if we're teaching engineering, we won't go, oh, you don't know this first law of, entropy, of thermodynamics? Oh, you're wrong. It's not like, no, what does the first law of thermodynamics mean to you? And what does it mean for this system? What does it mean for this bridge? What does it mean for this toaster that you're making? We've applied it in a way that allows you to empower your way of thinking about it rather than just memorizing it. A linear mode of thinking, right, is, is a logical mode. It's, it's critical thinking. Verbal mathematical thinking is critical thinking. It's a verbal, it's a, it's a linear way of thinking. Creative thinking is called associative thinking, where you, if I say, quick, name 50 things that are around, then all of a sudden you've got to name 50 things that are around. You can be very, like, you can be very limited. You'd be like, oh, an orange, a cherry, a grapefruit. Like, okay, you only named fruits that were around. But you can also go like, oh yeah, a can of Coke, a tree trunk cut in half, a railroad sign, an orange. Like that's creative, that's associative. So you see how one is logical and one is creative. The main thing about it is we don't teach students creativity after second grade. It's killed out of all the programs, right? Art programs are gone, music programs are gone. Drama programs are gone. So all those things where you could practice your creativity no longer exist. So that's the issue. So we're trying to reinvigorate it at the collegiate level. I'm the director of Design Block at Georgia Tech. Design Block is a multidisciplinary design thinking initiative across campus. So our goal is to combine multiple disciplines and teach experiential learning. So um, so that basically is learning by doing, not learning by like reading and writing, right? So we do that. We usually combine multiple disciplines into kind of a studio type of course, and we offer it to all majors. We have about 20 classes that we teach in a given academic year. Everything from bio-inspired watercolor painting to footwear design, transportation design, community engagement projects. And again, it spans multiple call, like multiple units inside your tech. So engineering, the natural sciences, the College of Design, business. So all of them kind of get to play in the space. So yeah, we just created an origami engineering class, worked with a civil environmental engineering to partner up with them to do an origami engineering class. So about 20 different classes and they range, right? So some of the projects we're doing, designing a bookmobile for rural Southeast Georgia to projects we give staff, which is a branding project for historic Hunter Hills neighborhood in Atlanta. So we're doing their, their branding. So like, you know, you can imagine what their road signs or the, their street signs on the side of their houses might look like. So those are the projects that we do kind of in the local community. And our intent is to kind of democratize design, right? It's basically the design should be for everyone and design should be practiced for everyone, by everyone. As Michael so eloquently said, because everyone is a little D designer. You don't need a capital D degree designer, like you go to FIT, you study fashion in New York and you get a fashion design degree. I get that. That's a capital D design, but everyone's a little D designer because we all have to go through life and make something or think of something that addresses an issue, right? And in that sense, we're all little D design. So that's what Design Block does. We engage with the community through design projects. We try to give back to our local community through design projects. And then we try to make sure that students have a wonderful learning experience. That is fantastic. So I want to kind of set the stage a little bit for people that are listening. Are these undergraduate students? Are these graduate students? Is it a mix? It's primarily focused at undergraduates, though we do have an MBA course and we do have some graduate student training. So in that sense, yes, it's primarily undergraduate focused as far as the 20 classes. About two of them would be graduate focused. UNESCO recently published a report, Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education. In this report, they advocate for a shift of pedagogy from a focus on teacher-driven lessons centered on individual accomplishment to instead emphasize cooperation, collaboration, and solidarity. 
They advocate for curriculum being organized to emphasize intercultural and interdisciplinary learning. And they say that at all times and spaces of learning, we should be moving away from thinking of education as just happening at school and at certain ages and begin to welcome and expand educational opportunities everywhere for everyone. If you follow me, you'll be familiar with the research that I did at Design 39. Design 39 actually reimagined the future of school and actually put into practice this new social contract. They moved away from teacher-driven lessons to learner-centered lessons utilizing design thinking. They moved away from teaching in silos to teaching collaboratively, ultimately allowing them to create these intercultural and interdisciplinary learning environments that are more relevant for today's learners. I particularly like how in the design block, the students as well as faculty are engaging in design work with the community. I ask Wayne and Michael to share a project with us to provide some insights into what these students experience. The library one is, is, so we were approached by the Coastal Plains Regional Library. So this is the library system, Southeast Georgia. And they basically wanted us to look at the library services. And because of the area that it's in, right, you're in Southeast Georgia, like, you know, outside of Savannah, right? In the rural farm areas in that district, try to create a library service or library experience. That's basically the concept. People can't necessarily drive 40 miles to get to the one branch that covers that tri-county area. So in that sense, you, they wanted us to go, okay, well, if you have this amount of budget, how would you make basically this idea of a bookmobile, right? And it just so happens that people, it's, it's one of our senior studio projects and the team consists of four students, two industrial design students, two mechanical engineering students. So again, multidisciplinary, it's an MEID studio. And this is a pro bono project, but it was sponsored by Amazon. So Amazon's like, if you have projects that are these community engagement projects, we want to know about those things and will help subsidize the cost of doing those projects. So the Coastal Plains, the, the, you know, the client didn't have to pay anything, right? All of it was funded by Amazon. One of our students actually grew up in that rural farm area. So that's why he was really interested in it. And that, so that community engagement was not only going to the actual library system, right? The, li- the head director of library services, but actually following them around over a weekend going from place to place, setting up picnic tables with books on it, right? Saying like, hey, yeah, this is gardening Saturday and having like a gardening community event and seeing the librarians cart stuff around, set it up, take it down, work with community. And they did that and weekly had discussions with community members and the director of the library to understand whether or not what they were making was one appropriate, sensitive to the culture, sensitive to the region and participatory, meaning that the director actually and the the librarians had a say in it. Like, if you're going to say, oh, okay, well, we're going to create this bookmobile. We're going to make all the shelves six feet tall. Well, if the librarian's only five foot two, they can't reach those shelves, right? So yeah, you could put a bunch of books six feet up in the air, but they're like, nope, not going to work because the librarian is this tall. And in that sense, from a human factors ergonomic standpoint, you can think about heavy tote bags of books. What they use are like canvas satchels to move around 200, 300 books. Well, that's not easy. That's not easy on the body and that's not easy on the setup. So is there something easier, right? So they're really designing with, not only designing with, not for people, right? You don't design for people, you design with people if you're really empathetic. So they were running trials and they had, you know, they were going out into the region, like our, our, the funding pays for travel. So they spent weekends out there and then they had like virtual tests and things like that. So that's kind of the idea. I have the presentation file. At the end of the file, they, they basically have a bill of materials, an exploded CAD drawing. Like, we're going to use this truck. We're going to go through this supplier with this particular thing for shelving, cart, hydraulic lift, computer lab shelves. And they have it all designed, right? That was the scope of the project, right? It wasn't to necessarily build it because you would need the actual funding to build it. But if they said you had this amount of money to spend, they have it all in a bill of materials to say, if you gave us this money, this is how you would build it. So that was kind of the scope of the design. It is to, of course, create library services. For Again, it's democratizing design. Can you create accessible library services for everyone in the community? The example Wayne shares about the dialogue that takes place during design exemplifies the many challenges that come when we dive headfirst into solutions. We miss the elements that make the solutions sustainable. This happens as Wayne shares by designing with, 
not for people. Think about the last initiative you implemented or the one that you were a part of on the receiving end. Were you designing with or designing for? We're designing change in so many different areas. As we do so, taking the time to lead empathy interviews, include all voices, allows you to design a sustainable solution and creates an inclusive environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued. With Wayne sharing an example of how students are engaging in design thinking, we now turn to Michael, who shares how faculty are engaging in design thinking with the community through doing projects as well. We have had several projects in the Atlanta community area around the West End and and some of these other historically Black neighborhoods throughout the last few years. We've done a water trap, we've done a bus, we've done rebus stop redesigns for the community improvement district. So there's just been a lot of different things. And so they kind of approached us and said, hey, we have been kind of working with you guys. We really like a, we really want a logo. We really want a new design. Can you help us do it? And we were like, that sounds interesting. So we're having a staff meeting and I'm like, I feel like we've done all this training. I feel, I think that it would be good for the staff to do it because the risk you always run with, you know, involving students in class is that with the staff, they're going to have a bigger buy-in and interest and we don't have to worry about, you know, the legal paperwork if we want to use like this design, which has been, which, you know, is usually the issue is like who owns the IP, right? So we're like, we're this staff, we're going to donate it. It's not going to be a problem. Every staff member can use them on a resume. It's not ever going to be a, a thing that's going to be an issue. So I said, you guys want to do that? They said, yeah. So we, we went about it that way and really took a long time over, you know, a year to go into the community, to meet with a lot of the residents, to have those meetings, to do different sessions, to kind of help them go through a design process as well and give us feedback. And then we came back and had some back and forth about what the designs look like. And then finally landed on one. We'll be writing that up in the new year because we still have a few more things we need to get. But we did a whole brand book about it and everything. Um, So with that, it really gives them a better sense of identity. And during that time, they had some of the local people kind of come and, you know, give them some signage and stuff like that. So we don't have to do we didn't have to do as much because we were going to create a sign. But just them having that brand and just allowing us to be a part of that was really good. And from a staff perspective, I think one of the things we really wanted to engender was just having the ability to really, really work firsthand with the community. A lot of times that they'll be a part of it. They may not have direct interface, but this was like fully direct interface. You guys are going to talk to them, figure it out and just gives them more of a passion for that work. Because I think that that kind of stuff is important, especially for people who are in design or really want to do any kind of real design. When you start talking to users and people who are going to be using stuff, And just gives them an idea and a a better mindset to to do something. Because our big thing with democratizing design is that why should you have to go to SCAD, right? If we have a bunch of designers here and pay them an ungodly amount of money, or why should you have to go do any of these things? Because everybody here is both technical and, you know, creative. So it's a good blend of like having everything you need. So for the bus stop projects and other ones, you know, we, we have local engineering firms that we work with, as well as other designers that can kind of bring that stuff to life. So it's, it's one thing to say, hey, I want to make this thing. It's another to actually get it made. So we try to kind of bridge that gap and not just be like, we made this really high quality design. Now you go do something with it. It's like one of the considerations we had with the staff in the conversa- last conversations we had was, how do we deliver the design? Who has these tools? Do they have access to Photoshop? Do they have access to these things? Who do we need to kind of, how do we need to support them? And if they want to use the logos or anything that we made, because we know that they're not, you know, a design house. They don't have people they may know who can print stuff or make things or do any of that. So it's helping them really get the goal and really build rapport with the community because, you know, unfortunately, there's several universities around there that want to do stuff with them and they'll do it and write it up for their own press. And the deliverable isn't something that the community can usually show. So it was very important for us to not only show something, but also give them something they can have that they can use and not be stuck with, oh, well, they did this thing and that was cool, but there's no way we can use it. And it feels like we're taking from the community. So we definitely wanted to give back as opposed to really extract value just for ourselves. So that was that was kind of the, the impetus behind that. And I think from a staff standpoint too, you know, when you start talking about industry, I want to design logos. Do you really? Because this is a very intensive process. And now you got to feel like what that process was. And they were like, I don't necessarily want to do that. Or some people are like, yeah, I do want to do that. And it pushed a couple of our staff members to try to learn new skills, you know, really inspire them to do stuff differently. So it was a really good experience. And I think as we go forward, it helps us 
helps the staff have a bigger, better appreciation of things, but also helps them understand, you know, what it takes and, and to have that perspective. So it was really a, a big lesson that I think they learned on the back end that they were like, oh, I, I see what you did there. Yes. To build on what Michael said, I mean, there's some things I think that Design Block does uniquely about this is two or three things. One, it's participatory out in the field. We're doing workshops and gathering feedback in the local church. We're not doing it on campus, right? We're going into the community. So one thing about it is it is inclusive and participatory where people are at. So we understand what they are doing. We're doing trash cleanups, walk arounds the neighborhood, talking to neighbors, like house by house. It's not the same if you just say, hey, can you come over here into this lab and we'll talk with just you? And, and then we say, we work with the community. You're not really working with the community in that way, right? So in that sense, it's participatory, it's inclusive, right? Are we truly trying to understand the community? And the other part I would really emphasize is it's empowering. By teaching design process, you said houses might be a little bit different from the community. It has a ripple effect because when you teach someone your design process and they see it, at engagement after engagement after engagement. At the beginning, they're like, I remember the community member was saying, like, why are you showing me these really cruddy little drawings? These are horrible. And you're like, and, and then it and then by the second or third one, it's like, oh, now I know why you're showing these cruddy little drawings. Right? Because if you showed me the fancy one, I would have just taken it. Right. And you're like, no, no, no. We showed you cruddy little drawings so that they're vague on purpose, they're rough, they're low fidelity on purpose because. Now you'll tell me what you really hate about them because we don't want to be so presumptuous to know, to say, again, we're designing with, not for. We don't know how to encapsulate the entire heritage of your neighborhood. We would be presumptuous to say, yeah, we've got a logo. We know exactly what your neighborhood or your people are about or your, or, you know, your culture or community is about. No, that's not possible. Even if you've done walk-arounds and trash cleanups for months, that doesn't mean you know that community that well, right? So that was just another way for us to learn about the community and how the community teach us. So it's mutually teaching each other what design thinking is. And now by the third or fourth time, the iteration are like, oh, we see how you got to this point. Not only are they exposed to the process, they're actually understanding the mentality behind the process. Design thinking is, ju is not just, oh, if I follow these five stages, I'm doing design thinking. That's usually a fallacy, right? Oh, if I just empathize, define, idea, prototype, test, I'm design thinking. No, you're not, because you're not actually... You're actually not understanding what each phase is about, right? You're blindly following a five-stage process without actually understanding what each stage means. Because part of that design process is you can go backwards. You can start over. You can throw it all into a ball and try again. Most people, if they just see a five-step process, they blindly follow five steps without actually living it. By us demonstrating how we live design with a community, they begin to see that and live that way too. Right. So that's the fun part. Right. Because then they go, oh, I see why these sketches are so ugly. It's so that we can work on them together. Like, yeah, that's the point. Right. We can ask you to like work because they're ugly. You won't feel intimidated by someone else who knows how to draw really well. We all draw like kindergartners for the next two months. Right. But that's the point. By the end, when it's handed off. Yes, it's a relatively professional looking document, but that's not what it is at the beginning. That's really living design thinking, not just like, oh, it's a process. As you heard from both Wayne and Michael, how might we democratize design? We do this, they say, through participatory and inclusive design. Through engaging in this process with community members, I love how they share that they were able to have an authentic audience and that together they were learning the design thinking process creating a ripple effect throughout their community beyond the four walls of their classroom. I also like how Wayne calls out that simply going through the five stages is not doing design thinking. Without this authentic audience, you can't live and understand the significance of each stage. This is what he means when he began the conversation by saying that design thinking is a lifestyle. As I listen to Wayne and Michael, I'm remembering my own experience teaching design thinking at the graduate level. There were two aspects of this experience that resonated deeply with me. The first was that it's never too late to teach design thinking and creativity. I was working with students that despite having come from really standardized schooling backgrounds, they were very reluctant at first. They had to unlearn before they could learn new things. That experience for them and watching them go through it was powerful. It instilled in me a deep sense of optimism that it's never too late. 
as Michael shared earlier, to connect with this innate part of what makes us human. The second aspect was designing opportunities for unlearning. This had to be intentional. It came through deep reflection. You can't just go in with adult learners and teach design thinking and immediately begin the process. With each phase, you have to build time to acknowledge what's uncomfortable, what are you unlearning, and what new things are you learning to do. Michael shares the shifts that he's seen in learners as they engage in the process at a collegiate level. I think from the staff perspective, they really get to see like the stuff we talk about in a different light and they really get to kind of understand it a lot better. You know, I've, I spent a little bit more time since we were in person this year going to the VIP class, which is where a lot of the students from across the university. So it's not just design. It's pretty much it could be designers. It could be you know, mechanical. It could be electrical. It could be anybody in that class. And so it was funny because as we started to do this year's project, they were like, oh, I kind of get why you're asking us to do this. It makes more sense now because, you know, it's easy with the engineering or like a mindset that is supposed to have the right answer, right? It's you're very much geared in certain fields to have the right answer because you need to um, because people's lives on the line or it just has to be correct and, you know, big money is involved. With design, it's a little bit more fluid in that the right answer is the one that best serves the population that you're serving. It's not necessarily the most efficient. It's not the most cost effective. Hopefully it is, but it's the one that most best serving the community that you're you're serving. So they kind of, as we got to final presentations, really had to have a different understanding of what was happening. And a few of them had the light bulb when we were doing them with our partner um, a couple weeks ago and said, oh, this all relates. So now we're going to work together. It's like, yeah, prob- that's kind of what the next semester of this course is. So for everybody involved, it's kind of like a light bulb moment as they go through these processes and say, oh, okay, so the things we've been talking about are doing, this is why that's important. I remember one thing in particular, like we got to, we had them do, we did a presentation and talked about communication and, you know, how to do that better. And we had, they had a, the students had a presentation for the Hunter Hills community and it didn't go over well. And it was just like, do you understand now why you have to kind of communicate things that you're doing? more clearly and make it very relevant to them because you basically said a bunch of stuff that was design speak that they don't know what you're talking about. So now they're all like, I guess that was good. I don't know. I still have, you know, 13 questions and it wasn't enough time and a lot of time because we were attending their, you know, weekly meetings from time to time to, to talk. And so we don't have the whole floor. We have 15 minutes. So if you can't get what you need to say in 15 minutes done and explain it, then we're not going to get anywhere. It's not going to help us, you know, build that rapport with the community. So I think a lot of it is just making them understand why this stuff is important and how it matters and why those soft skills are more important than they think because they just, you know, everybody wants to jump at tech straight to technical. I can draw, I can design really well. I can make this thing. I can do math, right? As opposed to be like, hey, can you talk to that person and ask them what they actually needed? Because I feel like you missed something here and you really need to understand this because I'm listening from half of your conversation and I don't think you're getting it. So like, I think that's the biggest impact for students that I've seen. As Michael shares, we are so often quick to design solutions. Engaging in empathy is one of the most challenging experiences. Earlier in the episode, Wayne shared how one of the pieces of feedback he received was that the class had soul. We often hear the term personalized learning, and this piece of feedback that Wayne shared demonstrates that when we engage in design thinking, the experience is personalized. Listening to them share, I'm curious, are these courses open to all students at Georgia Tech? And if yes, what is the college admission process like? And how might we use some design thinking to make that a better experience? In this next section, Wayne and Michael share some excellent suggestions for how students can design portfolios and engage with the schools that they're interested in attending. Technically, design block classes are offered to all Georgia Tech students. Once you get to Georgia Tech, you can take design block class. There's no admissions process to take a design block class. They're listed as GT series classes or the moniker for which the unit they were created in. We have GT1000, GT2801, right? Like basically any Georgia Tech student can take that class. So it doesn't matter what major you are, you can take those those versions of those design block classes. Now, some of the upper division classes tend to be more affiliated with the bio-inspired design class, right? It's going to be biology, engineering, and design, right? So those, if you're a major in those three units, then you, you can take that class, right? So no, we usually don't exclude anybody, right? It just means that it's, it's, it's housed in a certain major. 
So there is no admissions process to get into a design block class. The admissions process to get into Georgia Tech, that's different, right? So, I mean, but if you look at it from a design process, again, we offer summer camps. In the College of Design does, right? In design, we're looking at a design thinking summer camp as well, come, hopefully coming in the coming summer. summer. I mean, COVID kind of made it damper on, on in-person summer camps. So you can imagine a K-12, a high schooler who's interested in design takes a summer camp with us, gets to meet faculty, understands what our philosophy for the school is. They've gone through one iteration already. And so they've already gone through a project that was a summer camp project in high school. And then they can talk about that in their application right? They can mention those professors' names, right? And in that sense, that's a great way to kind of iterate through, right? To go and go, oh, I like that project, or I, I didn't really feel that that was what, I, you know, then, then maybe tech's not the right university for you, right? If, if you didn't like that design experience, then maybe there's something more specific that you wanted. Like, oh, I, it was, this was too abstract. I really just want to make clothes. Well, then, then go to FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. Like, go to FIT, right? You know, you'll learn about what you really want, Outside of the admissions process to tech, now let's just talk about in general, K-12. Are you using a design thinking process to understand what you want, right? So first, if you need to empathize, then say, well, can I schedule a call? Can I email a professor at an institute or the admissions counselor at this institute? I get high schoolers email me. They find me on the website, right? And like literally the ones that are really enterprise, like, so I took this design camp, da, 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 and they're like juniors, right? And then they'll say, what would you recommend I do next? Or they'll ask, I really want to do this. I saw your bio on your on the website. Uh, and I saw that you, I, saw, I read that you designed cars for Ford Motor Company. I really want to design cars. What do I need to do to get there? They're using that design thinking process, right? They're empathizing, trying to interview people, understand what those requirements are. I'm always happy to send you in, you know, I can't, I can't, sometimes the emails get a little bit backlogged, but I'll try to send you at least a paragraph back if I can, right? And say, okay, well, this is the way you might do that, right? This is what you might want to think about. These are the majors that you might want to research. And then come back and then, you know, feel free to take a couple months, come back to me with something. And then they'll come back and they'll actually express it. Like I actually had a high schooler in Georgia say, you recommended these things. I did, did, did do those things. Here are these things, right? And I also did this, this, and this that were related to that. And so which one do you think is the best, right? And you're like, oh, okay, that. So they're wa- working through the design process in order to get, now if they applied, right? Now if they're like, I'd have these three things I worked on in the summer between my junior and senior year. I'm going to use that in my application process. Not only have I done the empathy work, I've actually expressed myself. I've done the things they've asked me to do. I've tested it. I've given, I've given the opportunity for a professor to give me feedback on it. And so I've gone at least through one design cycle in my junior to senior summer. And that puts you in a really good place because your portfolio will show that you did those work. For, for design, the College of Design, we have an optional portfolio. So if the student wants to show an artistic or design portfolio in addition to their SAT scores and their GPA, then absolutely we'll look at the portfolio. And it can make a huge difference if we can see that they're applying design in that way. I love how Wayne asks, how are you applying the design thinking process to your life? I often advocate for students to adopt the mantra, find and be found through building an online portfolio with a website or a LinkedIn profile so that they can position themselves in a way that differentiates them from other candidates. This is not a concept that should be limited to design students. And if you want your students to get started on learning how to showcase their skills, strengths, and ideas with the world, then head to the link in my bio or in the show notes for a free guide that walks you step-by-step on how to get started. I ask Wayne and Michael to close with advice they would give to K-12 leaders who want to bring design thinking to their organizations to increase creativity and diverse ways of thinking about challenges and opportunities. I have an answer because my mother was a teacher for 30 some years and she taught first grade for a long time. She always made it relatable and fun. And so I think that one of the big things is from a parental perspective, my parents, my mom was a, it was a teacher and my dad was a preacher, right? They never really put pressure on me to do stuff that was just academic. Like I remember being excited about that and wanting to do engineering. When I got into it, that's kind of what I was into. 
But they were also like, we can go to the library and we can learn. You know, my mother was infamous for making us read or do some summer bridge book stuff during the summer to keep our skills sharp. But with that, it was always about like exploring learning. Um, one of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite memories my mother has of me, I don't remember this when I was three, she took me to the library and she picked out books because she was the teacher and she knew best. And she said, do you like any of these? And I said, no. And she said, pick your own books. And I did. And I read them. And she said, OK. So I think as from a parental perspective, you have to allow your kids to be themselves. I think that parents do a very bad job, especially now that school does everything. I was having this conversation with one of my former coworkers and friends and talking to her about her son. She was like, he didn't do good with you know online learning and we're going to hold him back. I was like, for what? Nobody did good with online learning. You've been in class this whole year. Like, that's not a bad thing, right? Because it means that you have to teach differently. I was like, what is his plan for what he wants to do? Is he going to play basketball? Is he going to do something? So I think it's important to foster from a home perspective, things that are very important to the kid and make it creative. Like I can't wait to have kids so I can like do crazy stuff, like build stuff with them on the weekends and, you know, be like, what do you want to build? What do you want to make and have tools and stuff to help them do that? From a student perspective and a teacher perspective, I think making it relatable and making it fun. I learn more now, to Wayne's point, by being having a creative project than I do like trying to watch a YouTube video of some professor talk about technically this is how you do the math. And then this is how the math It's like what? OK, how does this relate to you know real life? And so I think that's important where you can infuse that and make it fun to learn and to do things. And my mother did it for years in first grade and she would always have fun with them and kids would like it because, you know, she wanted them to be open to, to doing things that were hard and creative. And so that, those are my, that's what I think is important um, for making it more relatable to K through 12. Wayne, so this is like advice to, I feel like Michael, you gave advice to a teacher. Wayne, maybe advice to like a principal who's overlooking the teacher is a place to start. One thing from a principal standpoint then, yeah, absolutely. Because that definitely from the teacher standpoint, I couldn't agree more. One is the thing about, again, the A in STEAM, right? The thing about the A in STEAM, right? You may not have finances for an art program or a drama program or a music program or radio program or whatever it is. But but it, within your curriculum then, if you can't put the A in STEAM back into your K-12 experience, can you look at your curriculum and challenge your teachers to think about their curriculum that allows more than one interpretation for how they do assignments? Is there more than one right answer for the, the, the grading for what you're doing? If you're going to give a physics test, can you make it experiential? Can you make those physics lessons experiential? Don't learn force times distance equals torque. Have them play on a seesaw. Have them try it. Have them f- make a catapult out of popsicle sticks and rubber bands and see the principle of it because you're experiencing it. And of course, that creativity, you can encourage creativity in a physics class by saying, okay, I'm going to give you a popsicle stick and you can lace, you can use duct tape and put these, make it possible as long or as short as you want. The whole goal is to flick this P across the classroom, right? And you will learn the concept of force times distance equals torque. And you will learn about those things, but you won't have to count. You will learn it experientially. And then you have the math, right? Then you can say, instead of just quizzing you on F times D equals number, I'm going to give you multiple ways to make that answer. I want you to make three different catapults, one that can lift 10 pounds and one that can flick a little P the farthest distance. And now you get them to like think about it. Well, how do I use that mathematical principle in a way that's exciting to me, right? So more than one answer, more than one, let teaching students that there's always more than one possible answer even without a dedicated art program, will make them more creative, right? So I would say changing the incentives of the grading so allows more than one right answer, more interpretation, and make learning an experience. Don't make learning just reading and writing, because again, you're only focusing on that verbal, mathematical, logical side of the brain. Make it something that becomes associative. The way, and of course, you're going to say, well, what's the metric for that? Here's the easy metric. Do the kids run into the building or do they run out of the building? When the bell rings, time the students. If they run into the building faster than they run out of the building, then you know you're doing something right. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you have. 
in a world where time and attention are so valuable. Thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Designing Schools community. 